Nowadays, you can expect directional lighting pretty much as standard on any ready-to-run loco. But like most of the models in my collection, my Class 37 is far from a brand new model, a second-hand Hornby dating from the 80s, which I've given a bit of a respray. And in this video, I want to show just how easy it is to add some realistic lights just using bog-standard LEDs. As with most modifications, the first thing we need to do is get under the bonnet. And like many diesels of its vintage, this is a case of releasing the clips on the chassis. The easiest way I've found being to insert the tip of a scalpel blade, followed by a piece of old plastic membership card, going round all four clips, being very careful not to scratch my new paintwork. Then, padding out with more bits of card, the clips can be released, and the body eased up over the sides of the chassis, first one end and then the other, the spacers preventing it just clipping shut again. And off comes the body, revealing that I've already done a basic conversion to DCC by adding my own 8-pin socket, wired to the pickups and to the motor. The fitting of this I cover in another of my videos, actually on a Lima Class 33, but the process for the Hornby 37 is pretty much the same. So for this video, we're effectively picking up where that left off, and we'll be wiring our lights to the other pins on the socket. For the lights themselves, I'm using bog-standard 3mm LEDs. I've gone for the diffused ones, but the clear ones would do just as well. And I've drilled the front of each head code panel with a 2.5mm hole for just the ends to shine through, enlarging the inside to the 3mm bulb diameter, so the LEDs push to the front of the panels. To hold them in place, I'm using a stuff called Sugru, as it says on the packet, moldable glue, a kind of super blue tack that actually sets, although remains a little bit flexible, even when dry. And with it, I'm making a collar around the body of the LED, leaving the rounded end exposed. This pushes into the awaiting hole, the sugru sticking to the inside of the front of the body, squished against it with the tip of my tweezers, ensuring that it's nice and firm. The sugru not only holds the LED in place, it keeps the light from going anywhere other than where we want it. So a little bit extra on the back of the LED will ensure our cab stays dark. Then exactly the same for the other light, slicing off a bit more from the slab. The Sugru stays workable for quite a long time, so there's definitely no need to rush. But it doesn't store particularly well, even resealed in its original packaging, so it's quite a good idea to have a couple of tasks lined up. When it comes to fitting the second LED, make sure that the long leg, the anode, is on the same side, as eventually we'll be joining the two inner ones to form a series circuit, the legs being bent down in towards each other. But we'll save that for when the Sugru's dry, as we want to keep our LEDs as straight as possible, so the light shines directly out of the front of the lens. Then onto the ones for the other end. My Class 37 has the split head codes, so the two lights are very much separate, each mounted in its own blob of Sugru, but the approach for a central head code would be much the same, just the lights closer together, showing the same mount. You could even join the two inner legs before installation, covering the whole assembly with Sugru. But whatever you do, once everything's smoothed in, check your LEDs for straightness and leave everything to dry, preferably overnight. While the Sugru's setting, we can at least make some preparation for the wiring. With DCC, this is pretty straightforward, the blue wire providing a common positive for both lights, the white and yellow completing the circuit depending on the direction. We'll also need a resistor, but we'll come back to that later. That all seems simple enough, but that does beg one question, which is the front and which is the back? Our 37 has two distinctive ends. Number one end has the fan, and details of the fuel tanks on the chassis show which way round that goes, in our case with the motor at the number one end. But that's actually not that much help when it comes to the wiring. So I'm going to make myself a test light to check out the actual direction of travel, and work out which way really is the front when it's going forward. Having snipped off most of the longer anode, I'm soldering the cathode to where the white wire will go, the pad labelled light F. Then in place of the blue wire, a resistor, from the pad marked for the common positive, to the stub of the anode on the LED. All very temporary, so no need to be particularly tidy. Then refitting our DCC chip, we can get the chassis on the track for testing. Which way's forward entirely depends on which way we put it on. But for our test, the right hand arrow on the controller means our chassis moves to the left, and pressing the function button only has an effect when we change direction. So this must be forward, and the end without the motor must be the front, and our number one end must be the back. So when it comes to wiring the lights, we can use the yellow wire, and a sticker on both the chassis and the body will remind us which end is which, and which colour wire to use. Then it's function fulfilled, our test light can be removed, and while our Sugru finishes setting, one more thing before we get on with the wiring proper, getting the brightness right, and that's down to the value of our resistor. 
To work this out, I'm going to use my homemade chip tester, which essentially replicates the function of the decoder, but outside the loco, using coloured LEDs instead of the motor itself. You can see how I made it on the link above. It also makes testing the brightness of the LEDs dead easy, just by changing the resistor, our wiring also replicating that of the loco. Here we can see the pairs of LEDs wired in series, each with its own resistor. In fact, we can get away with just one, because either one end is on or the other, never both at the same time. And it's with this arrangement that I'm going to set up my testing rig, pushing the legs of the LEDs into the holes on the breadboard, the long legs on the first two, showing the same column as the resistor, then working outwards, anode to cathode, to form our two series pairs, completing the circuits with a yellow jumper cable for rear and white for the front, just pushing the plugs into the breadboard, beside the cathodes. I will of course be revealing the value of the resistor I ended up using, so feel free to skip this bit if you want, but it is interesting to see just how different the brightness is, starting with the one I use for my test lamp, which at around 250 ohms is really only there to prevent my LED blowing. For more precision, we're going to need a much bigger resistor, this one being 15,000 ohms, so we can expect our LED to be much dimmer. You can tell the resistance from the coloured bands, which I've only recently worked out how to read, or you can use a multimeter, which I have to say is much easier, particularly if your eyesight isn't that great. And this is the result, although it looks brighter on camera than it does in real life. And provisionally, I'm pretty happy with that, at least happy enough to get on with the wiring, although I do end up changing it in the end, but you'll see how easy that is to do. Whilst you can use pretty much any sort of wire for the internal connections, I particularly like this fine decoder wire from DCC Concepts. It comes in all the colours we need, and its narrow 32 gauge makes it really easy to work with. The 6 meters will last us for ages. But we don't need it quite yet, as first of all we need to join the two lights by soldering together the two innermost legs of the LEDs, cathode of the first to the anode of the second. Now the screw's properly set, we can trim and bend the legs together, confident that we won't disturb the two bulbs of the LEDs. And when they're lined up alongside each other, apply some solder along the join, being very careful not to touch the plastic with the soldering iron. So far, I've deliberately kept the outer legs their original lengths, so I don't get them mixed up. But now I want to shorten the cathode, ready for the yellow wire, as this is the end with our yellow sticker. And notionally, these are our rear lights. The soldering in itself isn't that difficult, but made rather nerve-wracking with the risk of melting the body, potentially wrecking all our hard work. So clamp everything in place to hold it steady. And above all, take your time. You really don't want to rush this. Then onto the longer anode for the positive blue wire, again snipping it short and lining everything up carefully ready for soldering, making absolutely sure the only thing that gets melted is the solder. Then one final finishing touch, a short length of heat shrink insulation, threaded over the length of each wire down to the business end, covering our soldered joints, shrinking the protective sheath with a coolish clean soldering iron tip. It's unlikely the bare wires would actually contact anything we don't want them to, so this is more about stopping them getting bent out of shape during reassembly. Then on to the other end, the one we're calling the front, repeating the procedure in exactly the same way. The eagle-eyed amongst you may notice that I've replaced the original glazing with some clear acrylic. One of my next jobs is to fit some flush glazing, and if you want to know how I get on with that, don't forget to subscribe. But for now, on with the wiring, soldering the white wire as the negative for our LED pair, and the blue one for the positive, just like the other end, the positive being common to both pairs of lights. Then on with the protective heat shrink, just covering each of our soldered joints, and mostly there to make everything look neat and tidy, so they only need shrinking enough to hold them in place. With the LEDs done, we can turn our attention to the socket, lining up the inverted body and the chassis next to each other, matching the yellow stickered ends. I'm going to start with the white wire, stripping a bit of the insulation and lining up with the pad on the socket, the same one we use for our test light, so it's already got a bit of solder on it, which just needs remelting over the wire. And then onto the pad for the yellow, prepping with a blob of solder in the middle, before lining up the wire and soldering into place. Now we come to the common positive and the 15,000 ohm resistor from our brightness testing experiments. One end of this will solder to the common pad on our socket, again exactly like our test light. I'm going to leave it sticking upright and with plenty of air around it as no danger of it overheating. 
both blue wires will attach to the top and I'm stripping off just a little bit more insulation than normal so I can twist the strands together, making it much easier to solder. But before I do that, I just want to slip on some heat shrink tube. Again, more to protect the wire from kinks, rather than just as electrical insulation. Then, with the assistance of my third hand tool, I can solder the wires in place, letting the connection cool down a little before sliding over the heat shrink. And that's the wiring done, but before we replace the body, let's put it to the test and make sure everything works okay. As I don't have a rolling road, this will have to be on the layout itself. I'll need to hold onto the chassis to prevent it running away without the body, while I double check my directions. Then I can test for the lights, pressing the function button on the controller. And everything's working perfectly. I've got my rear lights, and when I change direction, the front ones too. Both sets going out when I press the function button again. So I'm good to replace the body, just making sure that all the wiring is inside and not trapped between the body and the chassis. The fine DCC Concepts decoder wire, making this much easier than the chunkier alternatives. Then with all four clips back in place, our finished loco can go back on the track. Whilst our job is essentially done, there are a couple more things I want to share, just to make our lights that little bit more realistic. The simplest, and perhaps most effective, I'm going to leave to the end. But first, I want to revisit the brightness, and test a much bigger resistor. A quick search of the internet suggests that the lights should be really quite dim. After all, they're really markers rather than headlights, formerly just to illuminate the characters of the head codes. And I reckon my 118,000 ohm resistor gets quite a bit closer than the previous one. But as with that, I'll only be able to tell for certain when I get it in situ. The changeover is actually very straightforward, simply unsoldering the blue wires and then the other end of the resistor from the socket, then refitting the new one exactly as before, very much showing you don't necessarily need a circuit tester. And even if you have one, the results aren't always conclusive. But with our single resistor circuit, even trial and error isn't a chore. Then with the heat shrink slid back over the connection, time to refit the decoder and get the body back on once again, ensuring all of our wires are safely inside before clipping shut. And now for that final tip, which like all good tips, is super simple, but really effective. And that's to apply a small drop of PVA glue into each light above the lens of the LED, bringing the surface level with the surround. The PVA is milky when wet, but will dry clear. It also shrinks back quite a bit, so will require several layers to build it up, allowing each to dry in between, until you've completely filled each hole. And here are the finished loco lights in action on my simple layout activated at the touch of a button on my controller, automatically switching ends when I change direction. Their brightness suitably realistic. The same technique can be applied to many sorts of loco, and even adapted for more challenging ones, like the Class 33 I tackle in another video. So if you want to see that, or any of my other model rail lighting projects, check out the links at the end, and of course, don't forget to subscribe.